Well, it's the same with you. Um, well, no, it's Thank <laughs> you. 
Speak of the devil. We, we have we, spoken. We met. <laughs> we met. We met. There's a third seat if you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. I don't think so. I mean, you just took out the word first. Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to start and I think it's in the. That's probably on a paper revision, maybe. You can you can play by ear. I mean, we'll um, we'll probably click through both the requirements and testing, but you can you can pick up your own. How do I spell your surname, my Zamti? Z a n a t y. A t y. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. All right uh, sorry, we're starting a few minutes late, but um, that's some important people that we were waiting for. Uh, welcome everyone to NetVC. Um, uh, a few uh, a few things before we get started. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, change in personnel. So we'd like to, uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, bid farewell to our AD, Alyssa, who will now uh, be stepping up as ITF chair. So uh, congrats, Alyssa, on that. Thank you very much for everything you've done for NetVC. Uh, Alyssa was uh, uh, instrumental in getting us through the BOF and getting everything started here and keeping us on track. So she will be missed. Um, and as uh, some, I don't know if uh, people uh, were in dispatch, I actually missed it, but uh, Alyssa was presented with a, uh, a turntable that plays opus, so a little bit of something old and something new. Uh, so we followed with that theme, and we have uh, something old and something new. Thanks, really, I don't know, eat the mic for the last time. Um, thanks, and uh, you are obviously in extremely capable hands as uh, your former co-chair is now your responsible AD. So I will be watching from over in the general area. <laughs> and so that's the other bit of uh, important news that uh, um, replacing Alyssa will be Adam, our, uh, our former co-chair. So uh, it should be, uh, uh, perfect continuity in that, and uh, somebody to pester the write-ups. Um, and we uh, we want to welcome Natasha, who's uh, stepped up to co-chair in place of Adam. 
uh, and I'm going to stay on. So today we have uh, on the agenda uh, the, some, uh, some more administrative uh, items, uh, look at our milestones and, and disposition of some of the work group documents that we have. Uh, and then we're going to cover um, the uh, requirements draft updates and uh, then the testing and uh, Thor update and Dala update. Um, we'll, I'll get to it. In, no, we, we don't yet. So if we want to go ahead and get some more volunteers for that, let me switch to that. Is there anybody that could take notes and do JavaScribe? JavaScribe is an easy job. You just look at the Jabber and stand up at the mic if there's a question to be asked. Thank you. Um, so sorry, I don't know your name, sir. Jonathan, Jonathan's our JavaScribe. Thank you very much. Anyone for a note taking? Oh, you get a star. You get a star, I think. It's like really precious. You can trade it in for nothing, um, but you can show how great you are. So just a few high level items in the uh, you know, uh, major details. Steve, would you be willing to maybe take a few notes? Thank you very much. Sorry to impose on you again, I think. Right, and blue sheets are going around. Make sure you get signed them. Um, the note well is particularly important for this uh, work group. Um, if you're not familiar with ITF IPR policy, please make sure you are aware of it. Um, this this work to remind you is uh, is part and parcel of uh, having an I IPR free standard at the output of this work. So make sure you review that. Any comments on the agenda before we get started? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> it's good that we both didn't know each other's names. That, yeah. that made me feel better. <laughs> Love having new chairs. <laughs> um, all right, so going on to uh, um, the first item, uh, reviewing our, um, our work group documents and milestones. Uh, so we have a uh, first milestone of uh, uh, July last year, which we've uh, obviously exceeded, and that was the requirements and uh, testing evaluation criteria documents, uh, if we choose to publish them as informational. And uh, we did decide to choose to publish them, uh, so that's not the question here. But obviously, um, we've missed that, so we'll update the milestone uh, to May. Kind, kind of aggressive, but we think there's not much left to do. Uh, we already did a work group last call requirements last time, but there have been some changes that um, Jose is going to review that, that are probably a little bit more than editorial. So we will restart work group last call for two weeks after this meeting. Um, and I believe we're ready to start the work group uh, last call on testing, but we'll wait until after the, the, uh, the testing presentation to, to make that call. But the goal is to get most of, both of those done by, by the May milestone now. Uh, so the other remaining milestones, um, the codex, uh, the specs, and the uh, reference implementations of them uh, were due in May. I don't think there's any reasonable way that can be accomplished. Um, so we're going to update those milestones to December. And uh, there's also a storage format spec, which there has not been any activity on. Um, so that's also being updated to December. But I, I'd note that without even... Uh, any individual drafts on that, there's uh, probably unlikely that that December date will hold. Um, and then finally, there's a test result document, which again has not been started, but should be relatively straightforward after the testing evaluation criteria stabilizes. This should just be a simple output of, of that document. All right. So that's it for... Administrative part, let's go to, Jose is going to present remotely. Oh, Randall has spoken that he might have some problems with the slides and the Zoom video and not on the slide. Yeah. I guess we, because we just changed the... Oh, yeah, uh, so um, we have a different projector in this room because we requested a high resolution projector um, and I don't think it gets meat echoed. 
So um, I think the slides are um, the slides should be on the um, agenda, so you should be able to follow that. The slides are on the agenda, so you should be able to follow with that. Be that way. That's the point. We can double project if you can. Oh, but you can still project maybe into the meet echo. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Any chance somebody has a basic MacBook to uh, VGA dongle? It would be USB. No, new new MacBook, small MacBook. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah. Well, Apologies to those uh, remote. We'll have to um, we'll have to state the slide numbers, and and people online will have to um, pull down the slides and uh, and flip them manually. Sorry about that. But those in the room are going to get a very high resolution version of these slides. Okay, so Jose is he in? I see him coming. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a quick presentation on the NetVC requirements. This is the uh, version number five of the document. Next page, please. So uh, it's, it's going to be pretty quick. There are changes to the um, applications, um, some editorial changes, some changes to the requirements, and nothing to the evaluation methodology. Next page, please. On slide three. So in the applications, we we did some changes to the introduction, um, some editorial changes. The important change here is to the video monitoring and surveillance application, where we um, we changed the the rates that we had originally. So for the 1080p, we had originally only 25 frames per second, and now we added both 25 and 30. For five megapixels, we added a low frame rate as well, since for surveillance, um, in many cases, the quality of the pictures is what is important and not necessarily the, the frame rate. So we added a 12 frame rate um, and 25 and 30 for adding um, higher uh, temporal resolutions. And for the 4K case as well, we went from the low frame rate to uh, adding 25 and 30. So this is just to cover a wider range of surveillance applications. And that's that's that for the application section. Next page, please. Slide four. So there were some changes to the general requirements and um, uh, that was mostly for section 3.1.1 and 3.1.3. For 3.1.1, um, what we wanted to do is to uh, mention compression performance and so that the compression performance would be um, good for both uh, what we call easy material and difficult material for natural uh, content. So that is, we would like to see improvements not just in the easy scenes, but also in scenes that have a lot of detail, a lot of motion. And so that was the, the thinking in changing the... Um, uh, the wording for for that section um, also to add explicitly um, uh, a call for screen content sharing for both uh, moving which is static and also dynamic screen content sharing so that's uh, that that was the changes to to that requirement for 3.1.3 we had uh, mentioned syntax that would allow extensibility but we wanted to make clear that this is explicitly the bitstream syntax 
and that we recommend that there is backward compatibility. And so in this case, backward compatibility means that the changes to um, uh, will not affect legacy decoders. And by legacy, we mean just simply decoders that are that are working at a specific um, uh, profiling level will not be affected by future changes to the um, to the encoder. So that's really the the the, the essence of uh, the changes for 3.1.3. So backward compatibility um, for a specific uh, profile and level. Next, please. Um, so just before we go on, so this is um, this is where I thought there the changes would be really more than editorial. And I think this is where we need to reset the work group last call. So I'd ask the worker to please review this. I think this is more of a substantive change and we should realize what this means that you know, explicitly calling out uh, screen sharing performance being part of the target, um, you know, is, is significant and, you know, uh, requiring backward compatibility uh, for, for first, uh, uh, first generation encoders versus, you know, later decoders is quite a, um, quite a requirement too. So I said, welcome to please review those um, during the next uh, last call and, and make sure you weigh in on your views on them. Now I'd note that um, in, in other spec, in other standards, um, for example, in HEVC, uh, the, the first version did not have any target for screen sharing performance. And it's not until version four that was, was just published a few, a few months ago um, where screen coding performance actually ended up uh, you know, being significantly better. And if we're setting our bar relative to industry standards now, this is even a, a, a more important thing to keep in mind. 25% better than the latest December state of the art is a pretty significant <laughs> undertaking. Uh, any other comments? Um, No, go ahead, Jose. Okay, uh, so next next slide, please. Yep, slide five. Okay, so so for the basic requirements, um, there. Um, so we just went to the general requirements. Now for basic requirements, um, there was a change to support of efficient random access point encoding. We had that before such as intracoding or resending of context variables, as well as efficient switching between multiple quality representations. So this is something that we, we talked about before that um, would be uh, a requirement in order to allow uh, um, efficient random access uh, um, encoding. Uh, for 3.2.3, uh, that has to do with complexity. And here, what we wanted to add is um, a specific uh, sentence that would point towards reasonable complexity of hardware and software encoder implementations compared to what we have today. This is always, uh, we had in the document, well, still we, we still have in the document requirements that for the high quality encoding, the encoder should not be 10 times as complex as what we have today. But this particular paragraph uh, compares with the current state of the art, which is VP9 or 265. And so that's, that's the, um, the added text for, for this. And by meaningful improvement, we mean to say that there's improvements that are, are uh, visible, um, whether we, we, in whatever way that we decide to, to evaluate them, whether subjectively or objectively. And then there were no changes to the text for the optional requirements. Uh, any comments on this? Okay, and that's uh, that's Hold basically on. it. One yes. thing, Rosa. Tim Terryberry from Mozilla. Um, so, just a question about the. Is that better? All right, Tim Terryberry from Mozilla. Just a question about the first bullet point here. Um, does, this doesn't say much about when you have to be able to do this switching. Um, is your estimation right. that something like, um, you know, 
periodic aligned keyframes across multiple quality resolutions would be good enough, or do you envision this as requiring something like S frames? Uh, I, uh, Tim, I, I missed the last statement that you made. Um, do you envision this as requiring something like S frames, or would periodic um, aligned keyframes be sufficient to meet this requirement? Yeah, I think that would be sufficient to meet that requirement. Correct. Okay, then I think that's fine. Thank you. And then the next page is just the end of page. But just for Jose's benefit, uh, there's a quick exchange there. Tim will be sending some uh, proposed text to the list on that. Uh, thank you. Just one more question. Uh, low the floor mic. Um, very low power floor mic. Um, there was, I think, uh, reviewing the diffs for the uh, for this change. I think there was also uh, uh, an added uh, definition of profiles and levels. And uh, I think that's probably um, important to, to call out and have people review what we, it's not defining what profiles and what levels the, the, uh, the spec should have, but defining what is constituting a profile and what is constituting a level. So it could be something important for people to review and comment on. Okay, thank you. Right, so thank you. So those are the changes from the previous version. All right, and like we said, we're going to start a work group last call um, starting uh, now for two weeks until uh, <clears throat> until we get all the comments back. And please, we need some more reviewers on this document. Um, I don't think we have enough uh, eyeballs and feedback on it yet to, uh, to really progress it. So uh, we we'll get any um, show of hands of anyone that's willing to review. All right, for the notes, Tim. Anyone else? It's a pretty short document, and the updates are even shorter. Steve, all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jose. All right, so next up is... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Thomas to talk about testing, and he's also going to do it remotely. So, Thomas, if you could come up to the mic uh, queue, Mireka, is he on? Okay. We can see and hear you. Okay, cool. Um, and I can't, are my slides up? I can't see it all. There we go. Now I can see. <laughs> um, so I'm going to present the next update of um, ITF NetVC testing. And I think I, it's actually, I think, 05. I forgot to update the number on the first slide. Um, but there, there's only one change this time. Um, so the next step, okay. Uh, there are basically two new test sets in the testing draft. Um, I didn't remove are, the are you, test sets. Are you able to see me switching? Hey, Thomas, are you able to see me switching? Yep, I'm able to see the slide. I can read it on the camera. So. Awesome. Oh, on the camera. Um, <laughs> um, All right. So there, there are two new test sets. Um, they're objective too slow and objective too fast. Um, so previously we had the version one. Uh, and so these are basically just these obsolete to old test sets. Um, I renamed, uh, instead of calling it objective 1.1, I renamed it to slow and fast, just for less confusion, um, which reflects what they are. Um, they're basically set up just the same way as the previous test sets, um, where uh, slow has the very high resolution 4K videos and twice as many videos total as fast does. The next slide. Um, so the biggest difference with between these test sets and the previous ones is that these new ones have HDR material. Um, in the test sets, the HDR material is at all resolutions, um, all the way up from 360 to 4K. Um, it's encoded in HDR10 compatible format, which is basically uh, uh, SC2084 with 1,000 nit uh, peak brightness. Um, and they're stored at 10-bit sample depth. 
um, that means that these all these test tests, even the fast one, now have 10-bit samples in them, which means that you can only use these test sets if your codec supports 10-bit. Um, that is that's the, probably the biggest change here. Um, so, luckily, the ones we're testing do. So, uh, next slide. Um, so, the other difference is that we've added 240p content to both test sets. Um, so, uh, we basically didn't have, we, people were, we were concerned that we didn't have enough coverage of really low resolution, for example, very low bit rate cell phone streaming for like YouTube and similar use cases. Um, so, we added uh, six 240p clips. Um, we also, because of these, these small resolutions, being much, much faster than code than the fast, the big resolutions, we decided to extend them to uh, 100, previously they were limited to 60 frames, so now 120 frames in length, which is also the iframe interval. Um, uh, we, the, the limitation on the, the clip length is mostly a, a CPU optimization, so we don't spend a whole lot of time, to, uh, you know, because uh, the, the longest video basically limits how long the test takes. Um, so for the small videos, we're not limited by the time they take, so we increase the length to under 20 frames. Uh, next slide. Um, there's other small small improvements. Uh, Shields 2 had a, uh, uh, a gray frame in it, um, so that, that bug has been fixed. Um, the new version of it is a new test set. Um, the other thing is a couple of the videos have been switched around so that um, Objective 2 Slow is a complete superset of Objective 2 Fast, meaning that it only adds videos to Objective 2 Fast. Previously with Objective 1, there were some differences between the videos. Um, like Objective 1 Fast had uh, some videos in 420 format, and Objective 1, 1 1.1, the slow one, had videos in 444 format. So now the, the formats have been matched. And uh, you can basically, if you, you can run Objective 2 fast and then potentially run the slow version just by running the missing videos, which is a convenient feature. Um, it's not implemented in our compressed yet or any implementations yet, but it's something we could do in the future. Um, I list the end of my presentation. So the, it's just the purely the new test sets. And the old test sets also remain defined in the testing document. Um, for people who are already using them. But th these ones are intended to replace them. Okay, any questions? Uh, this is possibly a silly question, but um, I noticed that all your things seem, seem to either be 4 by 3 or 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Is there any need to test things that are weird aspect ratios? Um, so actually, all, all of them are 16.9. Um, the clips that weren't originally 16.9 have been cropped to create a 16.9 resolution. Um, basically, the, the weird aspect ratios, uh, what, they, what they have is different border effects. For example, right, because your video codec is limited to, say, 64 by 64 blocks. With different aspect ratios, you'll end up with blocks outside of the picture partially, and you'll have to do weird edge of, uh, you know, uh, special, special stuff in the encoder. Um, that's actually mostly covered by all the different resolutions, especially some of the, the 240 clips are at a resolution where they are partial block sizes. Um, so that effect is already accounted for just by having different resolutions. Um, I don't believe there are any other major aspect ratio dependent effects, until, unless you get into extreme long or wide aspect ratios. All right. Steve Botsko, just this may be jumping ahead a little, but um, as we look forward to a working group last call, I'm wondering if it makes sense on this document to hold off publication until we're getting close to finalizing the codex specification itself, since we might end up deciding we need to do more extensive tests and we now envision. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I do think that's a concern. Uh, like you know, this document has been up, you know iteratively updated. Um, but uh, the 
the other concern is that yeah, the, the test document does have a spot for very expensive like MOS score testing. However, that's not really been used, so it's 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 quite likely that there may need to be adjustments made in that part of the document when we actually run one. Um, so that that would be a concern for you know finalizing it right now. I don't see any harm in leaving it in draft status for a while longer. So. So I'd like to hear if there's any other opinions on if we progress the test document or if we just uh, let it remain um, work group document for for longer until the codex or further along. Anybody have any other opinions on that? I think very from Mozilla. Um, I have basically the same opinion. I think it's fine to leave it open. Don't see any real harm to it. We also have someone in the virtual queue. Hi, Randall Joseph Mozilla. Uh, I think it's fine to keep it open, as I uh, agree with Tim. Um, I also just want one thing on the previous discussion of the, uh, of the uh, sizes. Uh, I'm just wondering whether it makes any sense to have at least a uh, case where um, uh, it's smaller, where the total width or total height is smaller than one large, you know, 64 by 64 macro block. The 240 case probably does not cover that. And that's a question to the credit people. I don't know what the answer is. Um, Tim Perry from Mozilla. So I think that's a reasonable thing to use in regression testing. I'm not sure it's that useful in um, quality performance testing. That, that's a reasonable, I agree. That's what, that's what I thought I'd mention it. Thanks. Okay, so it seems like um, we've had some support for leaving the testing draft uh, open and not, not trying to progress it now. Is, is there anyone that feels we should progress it now? I'm also fine with not, uh, leaving it as draft for right now until we finalize the, the uh, subjective testing bits. Uh, I mean, the only counter argument I would do would be that get it, if you get it done, that means it's not taking up, you can get this document this working group last call isn't distracting attention from other working group last calls, and maybe we have more cycles to get finished. So. But I mean, if you think that the process of finishing the codex is going to discover, well, then, then the other counter argument would be having a moving target for what the codex would be are being tested as as you evaluate them might be <laughs> harder for the codex developers. But uh, I mean, so I mean, I, I, I think there's there is some benefit to getting it done, and so that there's a one, that's one more document that's not hanging fire, and two, it's a fixed point for the product developers to, to target. Target. Steve, yeah. there, is, there is a middle ground potentially, right, which is to go through a working group last call, but then not submit it for publication right away. Then you could reopen issues as they come along later, but you'd still know that you have some consensus on the test that you have already there. If we intend to uh, continually update it, um, if Thomas, if that's your intent, that you think there's going to be some substantive changes coming in over, you know, over the next several months, then, um, then I don't see why we would try to push it for publication. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're you're pretty sure that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's 99% done, and that anything would just be minor updates, you know, editorial level updates, or just adding a few more test sets. I need a few more test clips. You know that would be immaterial to, you know, to whether or not we publish it um, now or later. But now, so we go ahead and do it now. So I guess really, as, as editor, what, what what do you think is the likelihood of, of updates here, substantive um, updates? So I think I have done. Um, I, I have so far for each of the last meetings. I think there's been a, a, a fairly large update, but mostly it's been um, a lot of wording changes, but. Uh, um, I would actually consider the addition of test clips a very large update because like that directly changes the results you get from the testing draft. Um, I mean, 
I think I think that the, the largest, most likely thing to happen would be to for a new ver, new set of test clips to be added for some special case, um, the, and then also the subjective test, the inspection potentially changing. So I mean, if you, you know, if, if you don't if you don't consider adding uh, you know testing clips to be a large change, then, you know, we, we could publish it. Um, but if if you don't want to go into a working group last call with the potential for that, then it would probably make sense to hold off. Yeah, I don't think we want to publish stuff just to publish stuff. So uh, it, it sounds like there's really no strong opinion on on progressing it now. Uh, no strong opinion favoring progressing it now. I heard a pretty weak opinion from Jonathan, that self-questioning <laughs> whether or not he really believed that. Uh, so I, I think we'll keep this document open, and I don't think we'll probably need to do a last call on it because uh, if we intend to progress it later anyway, it would just be wasted of work. Um, so probably we'll we'll progress the requirements first and we'll uh, create a new milestone if we have to for, for the testing gap. They're, they're both lumped under the same milestone right now. So, um, feel free to make your updates, Thomas. Okay. Anything else on testing? All right. All right, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, so the next item we'll have uh, uh, Steiner give us an update on uh, the Thor codec. Uh, I have two topics for today. Um, I'll go through the changes in Thor since the last meeting, which admittedly it's not a long list. You can take the mic yeah, is that better? Yeah. And I will go through an update on, on the performance. I have uh, new data using RV compressed yet. Previously, we have been using an internal Cisco test set. So I think it's about time to make a switch to what we have agreed on to use in this group. So moving on to the first slide. Um, <clears throat> the new things in Thor. Uh, I've added support for monochrome video, which was a trivial thing to add, and also added support for 422 chroma sampling, which I made trivial to add. It's actually encoded as 444 internally, which means that it's very simple to implement and the code remains clean and simple. We don't have to uh, be concerned about funny aspect ratios or rectangular blocks. Um, the downside is that it, it likely gives us an optimal compression. Um, I don't know how much because I, I didn't um, do it the proper way. Um, <clears throat> um, but I, I think perhaps 422 is a corner case. Uh, one use case is interlaced video, which is an analog 80 years old compression technique, and we might move on to something better now. I, perhaps some, I think some sensors will give you 422, but again, um, unless somebody can come up with um, a real use case for this, I, I would be reluctant to add uh, a lot of complexity in the encoder and decoder for um, a corner case. So um, my suggestion is to just keep it as I did for now. And I also made some changes to the CLPF, the constraint low pass filter, some improvements there, which gave 0.4% BDR gain in the high complexity setting. There's a question. Uh, yeah, actually a question, possibly also for Thomas, is there any 42 content in the testing draft? Yeah, I think it is, at least in the latest test set, uh, Thomas will know. Let's take Randall's question first, then we'll get Thomas to answer. Sure. Mine's on the same issue. Um, I'll note that uh, currently uh, WebRTC code, both in Chrome and Firefox, is very heavily 4.2.2 oriented. In fact, it's all 4.2.2. So, um, 
Just a note. I think you mean 420 or 422? 422, I believe. No, that, I think that's probably a. 420? 420, maybe. Bug and reporting stats. <laughs> yeah. 420 is, is probably what they're. Yeah, to report. Pro probably 420. In any case, it's not 444. And so the, the question is, how suboptimal is the compression? Um, as I said, I, I don't know, because then I would have to implement it the, the proper way. <laughs> yeah, um, Tim Terry from Mozilla, not to jump in front of Thomas or anything, but... Yeah, Tim Terry from Mozilla. One way to actually test that would be to take another codec which does implement it the quote-unquote proper way and see how much difference it makes there. And it's probably at least in the same ballpark in Thor. Yeah. I haven't done that, but it would give an indication. I agree. And a test set ahead, only is uh, 444 four, four and 420. There is no 422 in the test set. OK, so is that something that you think you should add? Um, if we're going to support 422, yes. Um, but the 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 main use cases for 422 are generally legacy broadcast applications, um, which are not nearly as rate sensitive in general. Um, so it's something we could add, but uh, I, I, I would Does actually. Does anyone be, remember? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I would. I would actually be uh, pretty comfortable with that being, you know, having maybe. That part of just regression testing, um, or may, maybe one or two clips that are 422, just to make sure it's not totally broken. If we want to support it, but does anyone remember what the requirement says about 422? Yes, I think uh, Jose is in NQ to mention that. Go ahead, Jose. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes, exactly. So I was going to say that in the requirements, we do have a mention of a 4 to 2 requirement, but no, um, uh, I agree completely with Thomas that the reason that it's there is for legacy broadcast applications. So I think that it's something that we need to support, but doesn't have to be optimally supported. I think that most of the material will be 4 to 0 and 4 4 4. In 422, as Thomas said, we should have, you know, one or two uh, streams just to make sure that nothing is broken. But uh, I'm, I'm, I think we're okay with having it suboptimally supported. Okay, <clears throat> then I'll move on. And there are various fixes in four. For instance, um, there was a bug in the chromatom luma code in the high bit. Pep the case. We have uh, fixes for increased portability. And also, um, we have a code that has been taken from Thor and put into the AV1 codec. And whenever that code has been updated in AV1, then I've tried to take that back into Thor. So I, won't, I would like to keep common code in sync. Moving on. <clears throat> So um, I'll give some details on the change in CLPF. Um, CLPF has been presented here before, so I'm not going to repeat that. But C just reminding that CLPF is a loop filter. Uh, it will modify the pixels by a delta, which is calculated uh, using the surrounding pixels. It used to be six pixels. That has been increased to eight pixels. <coughs> And also, the uh, filter has a clip function, which is uh, restricting uh, the amount of change that the pixel can uh, change. And uh, that has been modified as well. It used to be a pure clip function, um, taking the difference and the strength of the filter. And if the difference was larger than the strength, it will would return the strength. Um, an improvement on that is to uh, <clears throat> change the function so that if the difference is very large, then 
um, we don't want to modify that perch and we want to leave uh, the image unchanged. So that's what's been done. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, I've tried to illustrate the new function. Um, it can have three different strengths, and, and that's uh, what the plot shows. Uh, the strengths can be either one, two, or four. It's possibly a bit hard to see on the uh, image here, um, but we have <laughs> we have the high resolution screen, so perhaps we can see. Um, uh, <clears throat> so what has been added is a ramp down um, bit. So in this case, in this example, uh, if the difference is more than 32, uh, we will not change the pixel, and if the, the values are between the strength and, and 32, it will ramp down gradually. And uh, the function takes now takes another argument, um, which is the zero point that we have. So that zero point will change um, depending on the quality. So if the quality is high, we want a steeper ramp down. And also, if we are encoding chroma, the, the ramp down is steeper. So this adds some new complexity, but uh, it's still quite simple to implement. It's still CMD friendly. Everything can be computed using 8-bit lanes, meaning that if you have AVX2 instruction set, you can do uh, you can filter on 32 pixels in parallel. Next slide. So, <clears throat> moving on to the next topic, I have um, ran some experiments using the RV compressed get tool. I, I wanted to include x26 pi as well, uh, but for some reason I couldn't get that to work. It, I couldn't get it to work. It, it had some failure in, in the build, so. I only have uh, four compared to AV1. And uh, it's, I think it's useful to have um, an update on this since we have switched, I have switched the test sequences. Uh, the old sets used to be pretty um, uh, video conferencing centric. So there's now a much wider set of sequences. Another difference is that I used to have um, clips with 10 seconds of video. Now it's um, one second. It means that it's, it's, uh, it, it, it shows much more than in-track performance. I'm not sure if that's very useful, but um, I guess for pragmatic reasons, the, the uh, clips have to be short. Uh, it's using the objective one set, which as Thomas said, this is now updated. I, I tried to use the new one, but it turned out that <laughs> 4 doesn't support resolutions that are not multiple of 16, and I hadn't time to fix that, so I had to use the old test set. And there has been quite a lot of activity in AV1 recently, so it would be interesting to see how 4 compares now. And what I found was that AV1 uh, now generally, at least on average, becomes better than 4. It used to be um, somewhat um, worse at uh, compression, um, but then again, it was something that was very, very close to DP9. So everyone has progressed. Uh, there have been many improvements in everyone and new tools. Um, I think Thor still seems to be slightly better at video conferencing. Um, in low delay configurations, so so with uh, meeting rooms and talking heads, for performs pretty well, and it's a reason. One reason for that might be for having the Thor has uh, one twenty eight by one twenty eight blocks, which which helps in quite a <clears throat> quite a lot with uh, these sequences. On the other hand, AV one is much better than Thor at screen content. Uh, and the main reason for that is a new tool in everyone, uh, the, the palette tool, which helps a lot for some sequences. Uh, and when I did this testing, I, I discovered that AV1 seems to have a three to four times speed advantage over four in the ARRI compressed service compared to 
what we had. I, I couldn't figure out why that was the reason, whether that was because of compiled options or different architectures and, and so on. So um, we should probably focus on the compression and, and not so much on the speed in the comparison that I did. And we'll also see that error resilience, which uh, is the only thing that supports, it has a significant cost. Um, the default mode in, in AV1 is not to be error resilient, meaning that if you lose some data, then uh, you can't really default anything until you, you get an intro update. And finally, AV1 is a moving target, and um, as we speak, new tools are being added, and uh, in the queue next month, we'll probably see a 10% improvement, perhaps even more. The next slide. So this shows um, for compared to AV1, and as before, I have uh, the DD rate on the x-axis and the frame rate on the y-axis, but we should probably focus on the x-axis. And, and 4 is to the right here, and AV1 is to the left, and uh, um, it's <clears throat> to the left, it's, it's the, the better side. So we see uh, with error resilience on, uh, AV1 is on average uh, about 4 to 5 percent better in compression. Um, as I said, I wanted to have X265 here. Um, I would expect X265 to be somewhat to the right of both these uh, lines, but um, unless, at least, unless X265 have improved a lot over the past year or so. And if we move on to the next slide, we will see uh, what happens if we uh, want that list. You jump to. What happens if we um, <clears throat> discard the error resilience requirements? In that case, uh, AV1 is almost 10% better. And if we move on to the high delay configuration, then also AV1 is almost 10% better. And finally, if we switch off the error resilience in the next slide, uh, then AV1 is something like 11 or 12 percent better on average. But I have to add that uh, there is a lot of difference between the sequences. So on this slide, we see, for instance, the Wikipedia sequence. Um, AV1 is uh, able to slash the bitrate by 80% compared to Thor. And I think that's mainly because of the Palat 2. But on the other hand, um, sequences like Curlan and also the video sequences, which are uh, video conferencing like, uh, Thor is uh, performing fairly good. Um, this is, by the way, low complexity and, um, and high, uh, high delay. Uh, and for some reason, for um, has pretty low scores on chroma and also on SSIM, which is not the case in low delay. Uh, if the PSNR difference is 10% there, uh, SSIM is also about 10%. So I need to figure out why this is happening. Okay, so in my final slide. Um, well, one quick point, since we're deciding to keep the uh, testing draft uh, open, Maybe this is a thing to consider. Uh, you know, uh, other standards have broken out the screen content, or in general, different classes of content that are expected to have wildly different results. So maybe it's worth in the testing spec to consider breaking out screen content if the results really do skew things to make them almost uncomparable. Uh, maybe it's worth considering for future versions of the testing document. On the reports that we get from other compressed that there is a category for screen content, at least 1080p screen content. But I'm not sure which sequences that include it. Probably includes uh, the Wikipedia sequence. I, I think that sequence alone uh, makes up a few percent of the total. Yeah, that's, that's really biasing metrics. So this is our final slide. What next? Um, 
we don't have a fixed plan. Um, four is still using the variable length uh, encoding, and I think the expectation for any modern codec is that it should have arithmetic coding. So one possible solution to that is to use the Java entropy coder, and in that case, um, perhaps it's more correct to talk of a merge of Tor and, and Dala, since uh, the entropy coder is, is at the very core of, of a codec. I don't really know how much gain that would uh, give. I, I think the VLC in Tor is pretty good, but again, I, I think to be taken seriously, probably need something better. <laughs> And another thing that could be done is to um, <coughs> uh, merge uh, COPF and the dollar D ringing. And that has actually been done in AV1. So much of that work is already done. And again, this would take the work in this group toward, towards a merge of dollar and D ring. Um, and since the, these tools have already been adopted in, in every one, so um, this part, part would take us um, close to a, 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 to a subset of every one, or well, actually, it might be more correct to say that it's every one that has moved towards uh, what we've done in NetVC, since so much of the work that we have done here has been now been adopted in every one. Um, other tools from Thor already in AV1 are the 7-bit interpolation filters, um, some of the coefficients from those filters, and, and the rest were based on what we had in Thor, uh, quantization matrices and, and uh, delta Q. Everything is now adopted in AV1. So um, that's what I have. If somebody has any opinions, some how we should progress with the code network, please speak up. Does it make sense to have a merge? Um, to me, I think it's probably a good idea to see things converge in some way or another. Yeah, Tim Terryberg from Azure. So. I still have my, my patches to integrate the doll entropy coder into Thor that I could dust off <laughs> and help you out with that if you, if you want. I think it's changed quite a bit since then. <laughs> Both yeah, of them. I, that, that, that was one year ago, wasn't it? So I, I think the rebasing is, is uh, difficult. Remind, remind the work group that uh, the, the output of this is intended to be a single specification uh, for the codec. Uh, so we're not going to progress multiple codecs. Um, we're not going to look for. Uh, multiple candidates. We, we we want a single interoperable codec uh, at the end of this work. So anything that could be done to help merge things, I think, would be a, a big benefit. Anything else? So, by the way, John Mark is going to say a bit more about, about the merge of uh, CFF and Daladiri. All right, next up is Jean Marc. Give a dollar update and see that filter. Yeah, um, so there wasn't very much to do in terms of update on Dala itself. Um, so, what I'm going to present here is the um, constrained directional enhancement filter, CDEF, that um, Steiner was talking about. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first, um, so Steiner explained what uh, CLPF was like. Uh, so a brief reminder of what the direction, the DALA directional uranium filter was. Um, it's a filter that operates on eight by eight blocks. It um, works first by estimating the direction, uh, the main direction in each 8x8 block. This is done only for Luma. Uh, then it uses a conditional replacement filter. So uh, the filter is kind of similar to the uh, CLPF function, except that there is no ram down. It goes to zero abruptly. And that filter is um, 
first apply along the direction that was found by the uh, direction estimation. And it is followed by a second filter that filters across the lines that are filtered by the first filter to remove uh, remaining ringing artifacts. Um, so in DALA, we used a global um, frame level strength that was quality dependent. And then each super block, so each 16, uh, sorry, each 64 by 64 super block uh, would signal a strength adjustment compared to the global frame level. Um, we were using four different values, including one value that would be simply turn off the filter. So that's how things worked in DALA and originally in AV1 when we had the, the ringing experiment. And next slide. So um, now we've actually merged uh, the dollar ring filter with CLPF. The result is this uh, CDEF proposal. Um, so it merges the two into a single filter, basically by replacing the second deringing, the second the second conditional replacement filter in deringing, that gets replaced by CLPF. Um, so the resulting complexity is pretty similar to the original deringing proposal, it's just slightly higher, not very much. Um, the results, on the other hand, they exceed both deringing and CLPF alone, and they also um, they also exceed uh, cascading of uh, deringing and CLPF uh, done independently. Uh, the signaling is still done on 64 by 64 blocks. This time we can actually select the number of different strands we have. Uh, we can pick one strand for the entire frame, or we can pick two, four, or eight. And these are still signaled at the super block level. Next slide. In terms of results, uh, these, this is what we got with, uh, with our we compressed yet on objective one fast. We've tested both real-time and non-real-time configurations. Um, what we can see in the result table below is the best results we got were in the low latency CPU equals, uh, CPU used equals four, that's for AD1. Uh, that's essentially a lower complexity setting. That's where we get the best results, um, mostly because low latency is not using B frames which do some kind of uh, averaging and noise reduction. And it appears that also um, lower complexity creates more artifacts, so there's more work to do for, um, an, for an enhancement filter. Um, but even at lo uh, high latency, very high complexity, we're still um, around 2% improvement in PSNR. Next slide. In terms of complexity, Right now, at the highest complexity settings, um, CDEF is adding less than 1% to the encoder complexity. At lower, at lower complexity settings, it is still adding um, 10 to 30%, depending on um, the, the exact settings, but that, can, that is not very hard to reduce. On the decoder side, the complexity increase is on the order of uh, 12% but we're still working on more optimizations to do there. Uh, we're expecting to get more into the six to 8%. In terms of hardware line buffers, which hardware people care about, um, it has been reduced now down to six lines, which was what the original during filter proposal was using. Uh, and for service strategy, right now we're using the first one, which is the whole frame optimization but it's possible um, to, uh, to simply select, uh, to pre-select some, um, some strands to look at for a frame and just only search that. Um, that is, this is how it was implemented in DALA and that worked fairly well, so uh, it should also work with uh, the CDEF proposal. Next slide. And uh, so what we have left to do mostly. Uh, first, we need a perceptual distortion metric. Right now, CDEF has a bit of a tendency to blur, um, to blur details uh, in textured areas. 
So we need to have uh, better encoder decisions to use lower strengths in these areas. Um, we have yet to apply entropy coding to the strengths. So that should help us reduce the uh, signaling overhead slightly. And last step is we need probably to optimize interaction with other tools because um, if we're able to reduce ringing, then we can configure other tools to get better quality by al and allow more ringing, which will then be removed. So there's still some work to do in integration there. Um, next slide. And um, so here we have, um, I think it should show up on the projector, uh, comparison of um, with uh, the kind of deringing that can be applied here. Uh, this is an example with uh, low latency at low complexity. So uh, a case where we see the most difference. So you can flip maybe back and forth between the, uh, the slides. CDF disabled and this is enabled. And then that's it. Any questions? So I'll just say it's uh, great to see a merge of uh, of some of the ideas. Um, I think that was the whole spirit of of uh, of the work uh, that, that we intended to have done here. So um, good to see that. Um, the Thor and Dala teams are working together and getting some of the common tools merged together. Uh, and, and the results are, are, are pretty good too. And I don't know if people noticed or not, I'm gonna go back to a particular slide here. Um, this is what actually surprised me that the, uh, the results are, you know, and I think, I think Stunner even had a, a up to 10% uh, performance improvement when you use faster settings when you're trying to do real time. Um, I think that's a significant uh, advantage for this filter that if it can if it can really help to improve the quality of the video visually and objectively when you're in time crunches, it allow the codec to take corners um, in other areas and, and hopefully achieve real time. It's one of the main differences I see between a lot of the other work and other bodies and the work we're doing here. In the ITF uh, ART area, we care a lot about real-time uh, encoding, and you know some of the other video standards uh, uh, are much more focused on offline streaming, um, so they only care about decoding speed, but never real-time encoding. And I think this is a really great tool for for improving the cases where you're under real-time encoding constraints. You can really take corners and and still make up the difference with this filter. All right, thank you. So any other uh, questions or comments before we close? Done a little early today, get 15 minutes back. And is anybody missing uh, signing of blue sheets? Anyone else need blue sheets? All right, thank you very much. Sasha's got one. Sure. Sure. Um, you want to take them? Thanks for sticking for the whole time. Thank you very much. I could take a the When you were talking and yeah, just for them. Nothing burned down.
Knowing when I stepped out. Um, yeah, sorry, I'll, um, I'll introduce myself on the list, I guess. That would be good. I'll be here, right? Yes, thank you, Ross. That's okay. I'm going to go and see Bernard. 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 I'm going to put the stars. I'm going to get up here. When they occur. Yeah. Good. Sure. Milestones, yes. Yes, I need to update. So, um, we're thinking about just speculatively changing the other ones to December. I would expect input and then work and then milestones to. Well, I mean, we've been trying to get input sooner, and you know, they're saying closer to three. 